Okay, I'll call to order the Senate Education Meet Committee meeting for Friday, April 7th. We are going to do bill hearings today, but before we start that, let's have our committee secretary call the roll. Senator Buck. Here. Senator Inate. Here. Senator Flores. Present. Senator Hammond. Senator Neal. Here. Senator Titus. Here. Chair Lang. Please mark Senator Hammond uh, present when he arrives. And let's um, make sure that everyone has silenced their cell phones so they don't ring during the meeting. It's after lunch and you know we've all been making calls. You're good, we just started. <laughs> um, so we are going to open the bill hearing on Senate Bill. We're gonna take things a little out of order just so everyone knows. We're gonna do Senate Bill 425 then we're going to go to Senate Bill 308, and then we'll finish with Senate Bill 442. We have members that are going to be going in and out because they have committee hearings and other committees. Um, but that's the what thing that's going to work best for all of us. So let's go to Senate Bill 425, and we'll welcome Senator Marilyn Dondero Loop. Thank you so much. Chair Lang and members of the committee, it's always a pleasure for me to be in the Education Committee. I am Marilyn Dondero Loop, representing Senate District 8 in Clark County, and I'm excited to be here to present Senate Bill 425, which establishes the Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education to develop a statewide vision and implementation plan to improve Nevada's public education system. With us on Zoom today is Michelle Ekstrom from the National Conference of State Legislatures and Nathan Driscoll from the National Center of Education and the Economy. Before I th turn things over to my co-presenters, I would like to briefly provide some background and walkthrough of the bill. I had the distinct pleasure to serve as a member of the 2021 Legislative International Education Study Group, a bipartisan group of 20 legislators and legislative staff this group studied the highest performing education systems in an effort to take lessons from these education systems and apply what we have learned to improve our own state education systems. Michelle Ekstrom will cover more on this study group and the findings which are detailed in the No Time to Lose, How to Build a World Class Education System, and the Time is Now, Reimagining a World Class State Education Systems Report. Looking at the specifics of the bill before you today, Senate Bill 425 creates the Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education to develop a statewide vision and implementation plan to improve Nevada's education system. 24 members would serve on this commission as outlined in Section 3, including three senators and three assembly members. Additionally, Senate Bill 425 requires the Commission to conduct a study comparing Nevada's education policies to those of high-performing international and domestic education systems, make recommendations on how to adapt the education policies of high-performing education systems into Nevada systems, make re recommendations on improving student performance in Nevada to those of high-performing systems, incorporate any relevant findings of previous or ongoing studies related to education funding and develop an implementation plan for the recommendations made, including an analysis of the costs involved. Finally, sections five and six appropriate funds for certain travel expenses and to allow the commission to enter into a contract with an organization to support the commission's work. I would now like to turn the microphone over to Michelle and Nathan, who will provide more of an overview of the study group, its findings, and the importance of these lessons learned and why change right now is so critical. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee, and um, welcome to Michelle and Nathan. Please go ahead when you're ready. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to participate and to discuss the work of NCSL's International Education Study Group. I'm Michelle Ekstrom and I'm director of our education program. Um, so today I'm gonna provide you a little bit of background on the work that we've been doing really since 2014 on this issue and the findings of the two legislative cohorts who have um, 
who have participated in this opportunity. Um, this really began clear back with the, re, the re, uh, release of the PISA, which is an um, evaluation of how well students across the developed world can apply what they know in core subjects. Um, the PISA results came out in 2013, and we featured a session at one of NCSL's large um, organization-wide meetings that December, releasing the results um, with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, who administers the exam, in addition to some legislators and other education experts. During that presentation, it became really clear that a lot of the approaches that states were debating at the time um, weren't necessarily the approaches that other high performing systems were taking and that our students were performing quite mediocre really compared to the rest of the developed world. So a number of legislators who were serving as um, officers of NCSL's Education Standing Committee approached NCSL and said, hey, we would love for you to sponsor a study unlike anything else that you've ever done at NCSL into international comparative policy work. We feel like we need some fresh ideas on um, what other high performing systems are doing. What are their policies and practices that are different than what we're doing here in the US? And so in September, 2014, we launched, we effectively launched the first international education study group cohort the National Center for Education and the Economy served as our technical experts in that, um, in that endeavor. And 26 legislators and legislative staff from around the country served in that first cohort. Um, we were happy to have Senator Joyce Woodhouse as part of that first cohort. Um, during the next two years, they spent much time studying very deeply 10 of the highest performing systems in the world, including um, Massachusetts right here in the US. They wanted to know how they were getting the results that they were getting and what were the policies and practices that were in place. They wanted to talk to the experts. They wanted to talk to the educators. They wanted to um, visit if they could and they had the opportunity to do so in that cohort to really understand what they were doing differently. In August of 2016, during NCSL's annual uh, summit, we released their report. It's their words, um, their sense of urgency, um, their ask of their colleagues to um, really spend um, no more time debating what we were doing in the US and to really turn our attention to what seemed to be getting more success um, in other parts of the world. The QR code on your screen is a link to that report called No, no Time to Lose. Um, in 2019, the, the most recent PISA results were released. This was right, right, just right before the pandemic hit. And there was a new cohort of legislators who had heard about the work in the first cohort, also wanted to do this deep study. So we began to again partner with the National Center for Education and the Economy and the Southern Regional Education Board this time, whose focus is very much on serving the Southern states around workforce development and education and put together a new cohort of 20 legislators and legislative staff who again wanted to um, to learn from um, their, their previous colleagues and what they had studied and to learn the latest on what was going on, especially in the wake of the pandemic and in the context of the pandemic. They were hearing um, during the pandemic that the other countries weren't struggling quite as much as we were. So they had the opportunity to meet with those experts. Um, it was nice to be able to do it online because we could truly um, we could truly uh, meet with experts all over the world um, online. Everybody was online and really dig into this. This time, the jurisdictions that they studied were in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maryland, Canada, Estonia, Finland, Hong Kong, Singapore, Switzerland. And then we also dug into um, schools and districts across the US where we were seeing them implement certain aspects of what you might find in one of these high performing jurisdictions. Here's a list of all of those who participated. Um, members were appointed by NCSL, um, NCEE, as well as SREB. So we have a nice mix of legislators from really all of the corners of the country and key legislative staff um, who really um, took the time to study this and to work together and to discern what they were hearing. 
Um, they identified challenges that I don't think will be a surprise to anyone, um, that by international, national, and state measures, our students are struggling and the gaps are widening. We're seeing that on our own NAEP results, on our state um, assessment results, but also on, on all the international comparisons. We also, um, they also confirmed what, again, is not a surprise that our current education system is not well built anymore for the economy um, that we see right now. It was built for a bygone era and it served us very well, but over the past decades, it definitely is not meeting our needs now. And these other education systems have pivoted or have been recreated in a way that meets, that serves um, their economic needs right now and into the future. We also um, identified that the pandemic uncovered some frailties within our education system. We know that certain, certain students did not fail, fare well during the, um, during the pandemic and it uncovered our frailties or our shortcomings in our system. We also know that it exacerbated systems like our inability to recruit and retain teachers to the extent that we need them here in the US. Um, they came out really strongly saying that we can no longer afford to lose any child within our system, that the gaps that we see in the underserved children um, are not going to serve as well as we send these children out of our education system and into the workforce, and that everyone is deserving of meaningful work, of, of, of leaving high school um, well prepared and ready to enter either college or the workforce directly and that our system unfortunately is struggling to do that. They also studied deeply and then we were structured our study around um, a framework that the National Center on Education and the Economy has identified as the key components of an effective education system. That is one of the hallmarks also of the first report, No Time to Lose, are the elements of an effective education system. So the ones that they identified this time are very similar, not surprising again. Um, and this um, beautiful graphic that NCEE has created um, it served very well as a point of reference for us in our study. Um, they all agreed that at the center of an effective education system is excellence, an expectation of excellence of teachers and of students, um, of equity, of efficiency, um, and that is supported by effective teachers, rigorous learning systems, equitable foundations of support, all wrapped in a coherent and aligned governance structure. Um, so they adopted this also as their framework and their findings as the elements of an effective system. Um, and again, the QR co code in the bottom corner of your slide points to um, additional information about this on the NCE website. They um, culminated and gathered all of their thinking and their findings into a report that they released in December called The Time Is Now, Reimagining World-Class State Education Systems. And again, the QR code is right there. Um, I would highly encourage you to dig into this report. Again, it is the voice of your colleagues. It is not from NCSL. It is not from NCE or SREB. This is um, a report directly from your colleagues um, communicating with you what they found and the importance of um, how these systems are um, aligned. And finally, I will leave you with this last slide. Um, this is um, really the message that came out of this last report. It's a sense of urgency to imagine and rebuild an education system that meets our current challenges and our future workforce needs. Um, they, they argue that the time is really now to, to um, address the challenges that we have in our system that we can no longer afford to sit by, to wrangle debate um, when we know that our system is struggling and that it's going to take states coming together, um, sitting back, imagining, reimagining your system based on the goals you have for your own states and figuring out how to map out policies and practices that will get you there. So that is all I have for today. And um, I believe um, Nathan Driscoll will be, will be presenting next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the Senate Education Committee. And thanks, Michelle and Senator Dondero Loop for the kind introduction. I am going to take a moment um, and hopefully share my screen. Um, 
looks like that's working. So please uh, shout if you can't see my presentation. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nathan Driscoll. I am the Associate Director for Policy at the National Center on Education and the Economy, um, as Michelle said. Um, a brief bit of background and context for our work. We have a 35 year history looking all over the globe at um, trends in education, um, economics and workforce development to try and really do three things for American policymakers. Um, we believe that insight and innovation that can improve our education system to be world-class can come from anywhere. And, we, and so we focus on the world's highest performing, fastest improving, and most equitable education systems in order to distill and communicate insights for American policymakers as to how they can improve. Um, we also have a big focus on looking around corners to anticipate the future of teaching and learning and the trends um, facing our global economy, our workforce, and our students. Um, we do this because we believe that the scope and urgency of the challenges facing our students and society today demands that we look any, anywhere and any place within our shores and beyond our shores um, for good ideas. And we also do this because we recognize that our students are competing in and interacting in a globalized society and a globalized economy. Um, and so it's incumbent on us to be thinking global as well. At the same time as we're discovering globally, though, um, we also acknowledge that the character of each of our 50 states is wholly unique. And the one answer for how to improve education in Nevada or in Florida or in Massachusetts is not going to be found in Singapore or China or Canada. Um, there may be insights that are found in those places, but those insights are going to need to be distilled and adapted thoughtfully and co-designed um, in, in specific states. And so we work with states, um, state policymakers um, and districts in the US to help translate the insights that we find so that they can reimagine and redesign their systems to help their students succeed and compete globally. And then lastly, we also recognize um, that the most well-intentioned policy designs um, only go so far if they are not um, intentionally uh, realized in schools and school districts. And so we provide um, leadership coaching and support uh, to principals, superintendents, and other state leaders, including legislators, to help translate supports. It's through all of this work um, that I've had the privilege of um, close to 10 years of partnership with Michelle and NCSL at this point, um, as well as um, a, a really productive and inspiring partnership with Senator Dondero Loop, um, at the time uh, Senator Woodhouse, as well as former staffer um, Todd Butterworth from Nevada. Um, so today, very briefly, I don't have much time with you, but I want to provide some context that I hope will be helpful as you consider Senate Bill 425 and do so through three lenses. The first is a brief look back. Um, why does the U.S. system have, a, uh, why does the U.S. education system have the, the system that we have and how well has it held up for our students? Then a quick look ahead. Uh, what are the global trends on the horizon, um, inclusive of COVID, but also post COVID that our students today are facing and will face as they transition through school, out of school and into the workforce? And then a look around our, uh, around our country and around the world at what Nevada can learn and take from high performing systems and from comparable US states and recent state innovations um, as it seeks to take its education system to the next level. So first, very briefly, a look back at, at where our system has been. Um, this is a, a bit of a history lesson and I'll, I'll hopefully breeze through it relatively quickly. But if you look at the character of American schooling today, there are a number of features that education historians broadly agree are really a holdover from um, the early parts of the, of the 20th century and even earlier. Um, this system was designed with the goal in mind of um, preparing workers for an assembly line factory model that at the time was quite innovative. Um, it was designed to address challenges and opportunities related to uh, immigration in the current con in the context of the time. Um, it was designed in order to realize outcomes of, of broad based attainment up to a certain level, um, widespread basic literacy and numeracy 
and critical thinking skills only for a few, because that was what the economy demanded. Um, and it, it was designed in partnership with um, previous education system designs throughout Europe. It may sound that I'm being a bit derogatory of, of our the character of our education system, and I, I really don't intend to be that way. Um, it was designed in the past, but I would actually argue it has worked quite well. Um, our teachers, our students, um, and um, the leaders of our education system have done a fabulous job of realizing the results that they intended to realize. Um, if you look throughout the, the arc of the uh, late 19th century through the mid 20th century, the US really led the world in education attainment, in the quality of our outcomes. We saw unparalleled economic growth, an explosion of our middle class, um, broad-based stable democracy, um, and booming production that helped us to win numerous wars. This is all due to the success of our education system, and I think we need to acknowledge and applaud it. But once you reach the middle point of the century, you start to see an, unfor an unfortunate inflection point. And looking past the late 70s through to the, the recent past, what you see is a flattening of our education outcomes, even as spending on education and our inputs continue to balloon. Uh, this graph maps the um, grade 12 math scores, which might be thought of as um, the education outputs of our young people as they're exiting the system in high school on the National Assessment of Educational Progress um, against inflation-adjusted spending on education across our 50 states. And again, that is inflation-adjusted spending. And what you see is essentially a flat line of outcomes alongside a near doubling of input. Um, so we were spending nearly twice as much in order to see the same results over the arc of uh, 40 plus years. Uh, this chart ends in 2012 only because that is the last year in which the assessment known as the long-term NAEP was administered. Uh, it will be administered again to grade 12 students in 2024. And But other indicators, including um, short-term NAEP results, other state assessments, suggest to analysts that this, will, this trend would continue if we were able to put an additional dot or two on this line. Um, so the pattern has broadly held. If you zoom out from the from the U.S. picture and look globally at the results of the Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, that Michelle referenced, uh, you, you see a similar flatlining in results, unfortunately. In the most recent assessment, um, U.S. students, and these are 15-year-olds, um, scored around the top third of the globe in reading and science. Um, but in the middle of the pack, and this is in 74, among 74 countries in mathematics, the countries that outperformed the United States almost universally had education systems that developed later. Uh, many of them are, um, are barely industrialized or, or not first world countries um, in terms of their economy. Um, Vietnam is a notable example of a country that significantly outperforms the United States on all three measures. Um, so these, these are the results that were fairly sobering for, for policymakers as they look comparatively and globally. Um, that being said, don't take the numbers from me, if you would. I, I want to acknowledge that although I'm discussing numbers, I'm really talking about children here. And, and this is an assessment, or young people, this is an assessment of what our 15-year-olds um, can do with knowledge. And if you, if you look in, into what the scores are telling you, you can read some data about the competencies of our young people that are somewhat sobering. Um, on the plus side, um, about 80% of United States students um, can read a passage, identify the main idea, um, point to cause and effect, and, and say if conclusions are warranted based on evidence. On the flip side of that, only 60% 60, 60 of our 15-year-olds can compare distances on roads, think pulling up a Google Maps app and finding the most efficient route, or converting to current 
convert one currency to another. Only 14% can read a passage and distinguish between what's a fact and what's an opinion expressed by a speaker in that passage. And only 9% can take a scientific fact that's given to them and then apply it to a scientific problem in a simulated environment. Um, these are applied problems that are administered as part of PISA. Um, so as I, as I continue my question, as uh, my presentation, and as you continue to think about what you've heard today, I would, I would urge you to just reflect on what that means for what our 15-year-olds are able to um, accomplish, how they will be facing the workforce as they transition out of high school and out of college and into work, and how we might be able to do better by them um, in order to help them be better prepared to face the realities of work today. Even as this is the reality today, though, the, the unfortunate fact is that the world is continuing to change. And we could do everything we could to maximize our results for the current education system today and still find it out of date by 2030, 2040. Um, this slide provides a very brief and very abbreviated version of a whole host of trends that we've seen over the past 30 years. Um, in brief, what you're seeing here is, um, you know, the, the results of manufacturing being outsourced throughout the 70s and 80s to other countries, as other countries are, were able to ramp up their education systems to basic levels and compete with us on the cost of labor. Um, the results as automation led to the extinction of jobs or the transformation of, jo of some jobs and the extinction of others as um, work in fields like accounting um, and x-ray technicians were fundamentally transformed by automation and certain positions were eliminated. Um, by, by certain estimates, for every job lost to outsourcing in, in the 70s and 80s, 10 more have been lost to automation um, in the 90s and 2000s. So, um, and, and it may actually be, be even more alarming now. So, uh, you know, think about what that says if our education system has not adapted in order to reflect the reality that the world of work and the world of life looks so fundamentally different for students today compared to 20 years ago. Um, by some estimates, there are nearly no jobs left today for what am amounts to approximately three quarters of our high school graduates. Now, many of those graduates may be able to adapt into those jobs, but they currently, as they are exiting high school, lack the skills needed to do about 90% of the jobs in the workforce today. So, you know, as you think about this, um, just re reflect on the reality that change is accelerating. Um, some of these trends were true. I, I graduated from high school 18 years ago now. Um, this was being talked about then, uh, quietly. But I would argue, based on the evidence we've seen, we haven't seen comparable ch change that has kept pace with the scope of the changes um, and in a way that's really going to meet the needs of our young people. So what do our young people need in, in the world that is fundamentally different in the way it is today? Um, in brief, uh, this is a huge distillation of a, a very complex topic, but, but I would say, I would argue it's in some sense a doubling down of those qualities that make us more fully human and able to compete with, with AI today. It's, it's being able to deeply understand some core concepts, but then apply them to a wide range of practical problems in creative ways. Um, it's the development of interpersonal skills, the ability to relate to peers, the ability to relate all over the globe and communicate with people who may not see eye to eye with you, and a moral and ethical grounding um, and, and ability and inclination to protect and defend freedom and, and democracy in our great nation. Michelle was gracious enough to cover this for me, um, but in brief, this is the distillation of our best evidence around how other systems have risen to meet the challenges that I just outlined. Um, she, she covered the, the components that are comprised in this graphic. You can find the full write-up of them on our website. If you take nothing from this graphic today except for one thing, um, take the very basic takeaway 
that it's a circle and all of the parts and pieces fit together because this is meant to represent a coherent and cohesive systemic approach to education policy making. That is more than any other thing is what has enabled other countries to leapfrog past us in terms of educational performance and increasingly compete and exceed us in an AI world and in an AI and global driven and globalized economy. Now, I don't know your state anywhere nearly as well as any of you um, in, in the hearing room today do, but I, but I have done some work with Nevadans. Um, there are many things that you all have to be very, very proud of um, that I think are just spectacular world-class examples of policy making. And I suspect some of you in the room have worked on these things. Um, I'm so, so heartened to see the, modern, the work on a modernized funding formula that you all have done I think you all have a really strong statewide vision for career and technical education and some really promising work going on in the ground to foster a vision for more career connected learning opportunities for young people throughout the state. I'm, I'm particularly familiar with some work going on um, with Superintendent Pam Teal in, in Lincoln County. Um, I, I want to applaud the work that you've done around strengthening professional learning for, for teachers and other school staff and around really robust early literacy supports for young people, which we know matter. And you have a fantastic cohort, I, I speak from personal experience and the experience of my colleagues, of, of school leaders actively engaged in Clark County and elsewhere uh, in professional learning around strong education systems redesign. This is, this is all work that's really strong and it's it's only the work that I'm personally familiar with. But I have to ask the provocative question anywhere I go, do you feel that those individual practices are as fully supported as they could be by a state education policy context that's knitting them together with a coherent, bold, and forward-facing vision um, for what your economy can look like in the coming decade and in, in, in the coming several decades? Because more than any other, that is the approach that we see in high performing systems. Um, it's an approach that brings together policymakers uh, across party, across branches of government, and across different agencies and focal areas from education to workforce development, um, to youth, youth and family supports, to housing, um, to really do four big things, um, set a big vision, link education, workforce development, and economic goals, find a way to reach compromise and float above the partisan battles that, that divide us today to really ask what's right for our young people and for our economy, and focus on the far future prosperity of, of the state. There are states around the country that have begun to embark on this approach. And I think there are states that I would urge you to look at as you continue your work and, and consideration of this bill and others. Um, from commissions in Maryland and Pennsylvania to focus on innovation as well as, as economic competitiveness, um, to nascent work in Michigan around establishing a framework to launch the state to the next level of economic prosperity, work through the governor's office in Indiana, joint convenings of, of uh, authorities across uh, bicameral houses and, and also uh, the governor's office and state boards in Montana, as well as efforts in Mississippi to more deeply understand the global context. Each of these uh, approaches, um, some of which NCE has supported, others of which we have not, and we've just been heartened to see, are rooted in the kind of approach that I described uh, just before, and I think are really promising avenues for your state to consider as, as you wrestle with this problem. So I want to close. Thank you for your time, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and applaud you for the work that you're doing today. Thank you very much. Thank you for those great presentations. Um, committee, are, do you have any questions? Senator Titus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Dondero Loop, for, for recognizing the educational needs and trying to improve them. But with all this long, this testimony that we have from two different sources and the commission that was already started and all the things that they identified, why do we need yet another commission to reaffirm?
confirm what has just been presented to us and how we can, it looks like these studies have already been done. And so why do we need yet another commission to repeat that? Marilyn Dondero Loop, for the record, thank you for the question. I think that one of the important things is, is yes, yes, we have some broad scope materials and information, but I think that we need to start narrowing it down to work, what works here in Nevada. I've had a lot of conversation with um, one of my counterparts in Montana and uh, down in the south, another one, uh, in all those states. And they all do things a little bit differently for different reasons, right? Whether they have more school districts, whether they have less funding, more funding, um, whether they had different issues than we have. Um, but uh, one thing was clear. We needed to have sort of a moment where we all came together and said, this is how we're going to proceed. So I don't know if that exactly answers your question, and I appreciate um, your thought of, you know, why do we need to do this if it's already done? But I think that we need to come together as a state with these members listed and um, solidify where we're going in Nevada. Follow-up, Madam Chair? So currently then, are all these different, uh, like the superintendents or Department of Education, the principals, the unions, are they all just living in their own silos or haven't they been communicating with each other already? Marilyn Dondero Loop, for the record, I would suggest that some of them might have been communicating, but I don't know that all of them are, and I do think that um, we have been uh, fairly siloed in this um, state. Um, certainly, um, we have uh, people who may not appreciate the smallness of Douglas County to the bigness of Washoe or, you know, that there are charter schools in some counties, maybe not in others. Um, we have um, uh, trustees that re enact differently in different counties. I just think that very much so we have some silos but I would not take away that we don't have some people that might be working together. Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just really quick, how will they work with NDE? Like, you know, they have a master plan Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, yes, they do have a master plan, but that master plan is continually, continually um, being uh, redefined and m making it more um, uh, coordinated and um, efficient for our state. Um, as you heard in the presentation, um, what we did for a long time worked, but what we're doing now isn't. So, and I don't mean isn't in a horrible negative way, but I think that we need to um, change things to move along. And so I think that this would help us uh, be more efficient in doing that. Any questions at this end? Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Ling. Um, a couple of uh, thoughts. So SB 72, uh, we just um, passed out a committee, aside from one nay, um, and it has five studies. And the way I see this is kind of, like you're gonna look at all these studies that um, the national organizations have thought as thoughtful. When Inevitably, we know from the research that accountability leads to student achievement, whether it be accountability in discipline, accountability in, um, in student outcomes, um, up and down the system. So from student to teacher to uh, district staff to principal um, to parents. And so my question is along with my colleague um, down there, um, goes with the idea of why another um, commission and why not the Department of Ed who has all of this, why, to me it just doesn't seem like it's going to be efficient and effective when we're getting all these people together 
outside of who's actually the actors and um, in the classrooms and it just doesn't seem effective. Um, thank you very much for the question. Marilyn Don Darrow Loop for the record. I, I think that when you look at the list, um, we've incorporated people who uh, may have teachers involved. We certainly recommend on Section 3 1G one member who is a teacher. We certainly recommend one uh, on Section 3 1 F one member who is a State Board of Education member. We have Board of Trustees members. We have legislators because all those people have different roles in con um, convening on what happens in education, whether it's the financing, whether it's the teaching in the classroom, whether it's the administration, or whether it's those who um, might need to be the person that actually uh, monitors the finances within a school district, whether it's a charter school or a public school. So I guess that I would say that um, the convening of these experts, including teachers, and I very much think we should listen to teachers and administrators about what's going on in their schools and what is working and what we can make a uh, difference with. But um, on the bigger picture, um, when we studied these other um, education systems in other countries, uh, one of the things that I always say when people ask me, what did you learn? One of the takeaways was the teachers, that the teachers were very, very much involved in mentoring other teachers, designing the curriculum. The teachers were much more involved in some of these programs than we um, give credit sometimes to our teachers here. At least that was my perspective. Thank you, uh, Chair Lang. Also, so SB 72 had five studies. So um, I know that that's going to be going on potentially concurrently to this. How do you, what's your feelings on that? It just seems like it's a duplicative um, process. Thank you very much for the questions. Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. Um, those, I, I'm not, I don't have SB 72 in front of me, so I can't run off all those, but I can tell you that this commission on is to develop a statewide vision and implementation plan. I think that each one of those studies were um, more specific to an issue. And one more, if I may. So we know that when we look at our state, we have pockets of excellence and then um, some that are needing um, more support. And when we look at that, I guess I'm wondering how is this going to target what we all know are the issues in our state? Thank you very much for the question. Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. I think you've hit it right on the head. Um, if we have pockets of excellence, we're going to take those pockets of excellence and um, take, take those and help others to to reinvent in their schools what we see as excellence. And that's what we're doing here. We're taking pockets of excellence from around the world and re bringing them to our school districts here in America and um, redesigning what we're doing and rethinking what we're doing and um, planning to improve what we're doing. So if you have a school that's doing an excellent, um, and I have seen this done in some of our school districts here in Nevada, where you have a school, a school that is doing a really excellent job and they partner with another school, that doesn't mean that other school isn't doing anything right. That means we partner and we talk together and we, we let the teachers create and, and move forward on the excellence that they're doing. And, and I've watched this happen and, and what a wonderful process to let schools that have a, a really awesome, I don't know, STEM project um, teach another school how to do that same thing in their school. And I like that. Um, I guess, too, when we look at other countries, we don't necessarily um, all students having access. I feel like in the United States of America, all children have access to public education. And in other countries, um, there are different pathways for students, and they don't necessarily have access um, to education. So I just wanted that on the record. 
Thank you. I think we have one more question. Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. I shouldn't ask this question, but I, I was just thinking. So I happened to watch the school board trustees meeting, which happened to be this week. And after we did our Senate Finance wonderful Friday meeting, they ended up doing, cons I don't know if it was community priorities meeting. And what came back was they have a classroom size actually ended up very low on the community's priority list for the money that we will be giving them over the biennium. So how would this national group help to persuade, move the large school district away from policy that is probably not beneficial for kids because they would argue, well, the community said this, but that's actually not probably a wise move to not manage classroom sizes for the next biennium. Thank you very much. Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. So um, I have also, I also have many personal thoughts on that discussion. But um, what I guess I would say is, I think when you do community surveys is what I think you're talking about. I think that a lot of times when you do community surveys, first of all, it's like any survey or anything that you do, right? If we all answer, that's one thing. If you have 400 people answer from wherever, it's another thing. So that's number one. Number two, I think that um, right now, um, if you ask any parent, I mean, they're probably pretty concerned about safety or they're probably pretty concerned about whatever, right? So we can put those things at the top. But I can tell you 100% when I knock on doors and I have all different economic areas and I knock on doors, and you, you well as well know, I've been in a lot of schools in my lifetime. I always hear the same thing. I love my teacher. I love my child's classroom. There are too many kids. But they also have a disconnect with, and I don't like what the school district is doing. So I think what we've got to do is bring it back down to where our kids are and start thinking about, these types of things, what is it that makes these education systems good? Small classrooms, teachers that are innovative, teachers that get to design curriculum with other teachers, um, and, and let those things drive us. Sure, we, we absolutely need to have the safety, and sure, we absolutely need to have teacher pay or whatever those things are at the top, but I do think that it has been shown over and over again that less, um, and, and actually this body is a perfect example of that, right? We have 63 of us, and we all pretty much know each other, and we can talk to each other. We can go to each other's uh, offices or, or see each other every day. Then there's a state like New Hampshire, 400 and some in the House of, House of Representatives. Some of those people, I'm sure they all know each other, but I mean, some of those people have a very small area, but don't interact as much. So I think that our small body begets some really positive things, and I think that we need to think about that in a school setting. So we need to have you know, good classroom numbers so kids get attention and one-on-one -on -one time and um, the help that they need or, or the success that they need. And, um, and I think that um, I realize that we don't maybe have enough schools in every district or every place that we need, but um, there's also ways of doing things um, so that kids have more one-on-one -on -one time. I, I can only reflect to when I um, I taught second grade at one point. There were five of us teaching second grade, and we did things very creatively because we had a principal who allowed us to do that, who allowed us to have small groups of kids while other teachers took larger group of kids to do whatever they did, right? Maybe they did a science lesson in a larger group while we took smaller groups for reading and math. Maybe we did um, a smaller group with science while somebody else 
um, read a book to kids, right? I mean, but we did creative things, to, but we worked together as a team in that second grade. Um, so there's so many ideas out there and teachers are full of them. I just think that we need to allow some, um, some conversation about that. Thank you. I don't see any further questions. So if you'd like to step back, we'll go ahead and open it up for comment. Is there anyone in the room in Carson City that would like to speak in favor of Senate Bill 425? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Prusinski here representing Nevada Association of School Superintendents. And we're uh, very conscious there are lots of commissions. Uh, this commission, uh, to me, is a little bit, and to our organization, I should say, is a little bit different in that, first of all, it's a broad, broad brush of people who are involved. You have the counties, you've got the cities, you've got the uh, ENCHI, um, I mean, teachers and associations and the superintendents, and we're very happy that they have a position on this commission. But they're starting out, too, with a, a little bit different look at things. They're starting out with an international uh, view. I mean, they, they can bring uh, people on this commission, can bring that uh, to the discu discussion points that will uh, be happening in um, you know, when these folks get together and meet. So uh, it's a little bit different approach, and uh, we appreciate the fact that superintendents are involved, but I think this is a commission that's going to bring lots of ideas from lots of different uh, corners of our state, and uh, it's going to be able to do some good work. So we're in support. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in Carson City? BPS, is there anyone on the line that would like to speak in favor of this bill? I testify in support of SB 425. Press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in support of SB 425. Press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers willing to testify in support of this Thank you. And I'm looking at Las Vegas and I see someone sitting there and I'm just wanting to make sure, did you want to testify in favor of Senate Bill 425? No. Okay. Anyone in Carson City against in opposition to Senate Bill 425? Anyone in Las Vegas wanting to speak in opposition to Senate Bill 425? MBPS, is there anyone on the phones? To testify in opposition of SB 425, press star 9 to take your place in the queue now. Hi, good afternoon. This is Alexander Marks at the Nevada State Education Association. Um, SB 425 creates a very broad stakeholder commission. Um, we appreciate the inclusion of a teacher member appointed by our president. Um, however, we would point out that the commission includes teachers and administrators while other educators are not included in the composition of this commission. Uh, further, the process by which the teacher appointing authorities are to co or coordinate with uh, appointments to the uh, board to ensure that there's one elementary and one secondary, as well as one urban and one rural teacher, um, alternating characteristics at the beginning of each term could prove cumbersome and potentially exclude half of all teachers. Um, NSEA would ask that uh, Senate Bill 425 be amended to include a broader representation of school employees and to simplify the teacher appointing process. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in wanting to speak in opposition to 425? Okay, there are no more calls wanting to testify in opposition. Thank you. Sir, did you want to speak? Are you going to speak in opposition? Yes, please approach. State your name, first and last name, and then go ahead and give your testimony, and you have two minutes. Test, test, okay. Hi, this is my first time here. Oh, my name is Jeff Nell, uh, Churchill County. Sir, could you spell your name just so they get it right for the record? Okay, it's uh, Jeff, G-E-O-F-F, -F, as English means God's peace. 
Okay, Nell, K N E L L. It's pronounced Nell, like knee and knife. Um, this has been very interesting, very overwhelming, and stuff this way. Um, socialism, communism has infiltrated our system. I'm on the streets in Churchill County, Reno, Sparks, Las Vegas, Henderson, and I come across the teenagers, schools, they're not knowing the First Amendment. They cannot name the five parts of the First Amendment. It's really, really sad. Now, when it comes to mobility and stuff, transition and stuff, that's great. But um, it's the system is hosed. When I'm on the boots on the ground, I come across these students. Also, I'm a street preacher, and I counter all kinds of cultures. I'm retired Navy. My son was a combat veteran, and he died. And what's my point is your system is very poor. And it's an indoctrination of these presentations. It's socialism, it's communism, Luciferian. I see it out there. We are destroying this nation. And I wish you would understand that what you're doing is not of God. It is not biblical. biblical. I'm sorry, I got laryngitis. But it is not biblical. And it's sad. I go to the school board meetings. I go to Washoe County's school board, and they're, they're full, full of Luciferian ideology, political philosophies, and ideology. I wish you wake up and see what's going on out there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on uh, wanting to speak in opposition? Anyone wishing, wishing, sorry, can't get my words out, wishing to speak in neutral? Anyone in Las Vegas wishing to speak in neutral? MBPS, anyone on the phone lines? Yeah, there are no calls willing to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you. With that, Senator John Darrell Loop, would you like to do a closing statement? Thank you uh, very, very much, committee and chair, for listening to uh, Senate Bill 425. And I would like to just remind all of you that this is a commission to address a systemic review. And so with that, um, I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, and I'll be back in just a little bit. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 425, and I will open the hearing on Senate Bill 308. Senator Flores, when you're ready, Let's do it. go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, esteemed colleagues of the Senate Education Committee. I am Senator Edgar Flores, representing Senate District 2, and I am here to proudly present Senate Bill 308. Uh, I am joined by Cabrina, uh, Cabrina excuse me, uh, uh, Fezzer, um, who is the Operations Officer for the Public Employees Retirement System of Nevada. Uh, she is not here uh, to advocate for Senate Bill 308. I asked her to join me today uh, as a subject matter expert. Uh, we're going to be talking about PERS uh, and when they vest. Uh, and so I just wanted to have somebody here who could address a lot of those technical questions that we may engage in. But again, uh, she is neither advocating for and or uh, presenting a position on, on behalf of the board or anybody else. She is just here uh, to provide subject matter expertise. I am going to be working off strictly my conceptual amendment. We are in crunch time and unfortunately um, I did not want to request that legal put this together in, as we just recently came up with this language. Um, I also want to do a quick shout out to CCEA um, because uh, during the interim, 
uh, we had an opportunity. Uh, a lot of the, the members of this committee were actually present. We had a forum where we had several hundred teachers uh, present concerns, um, present some of the challenges that they have, and in that conversation um, on a Saturday with a lot of educators, I had an opportunity uh, to meet a group of educators uh, from the Clark County School District who are here on a J-1 exchange program. Um, to simplify that, though uh, it's obviously much more technical, there are teachers uh, primarily from the Philippines who are a part of our school district now. Uh, there is a recruitment process where uh, folk will go out to the Philippines, see if they meet a minimum criteria, and they invite them to help uh, our school district. As we know, we have a huge teacher shortage. And they uh, participate, they apply for a program, they typically come on a J-1 visa, um, or a program, better said, and it's a three years is, is what the program typically lasts. And then at times, they will extend that two additional times each time a year. So at times they will be, be here for five years, but typically they're not, they're just here for three years. Uh, another thing that's really important is that the, the teachers that come here on this J-1 are working with our most vulnerable population of students. Um, it's usually uh, uh, primarily working with students that have IEPs and have a whole host of additional challenges. Um, and so our schools are obviously very appreciative of their work and they've made it abundantly clear that they would not be able to operate without the services that they provide. Um, and I make that point because I wanted to see how I could help them. And one of the, one of the first things we, we conversed about is because they don't reach the five years and PERS are vested at five years, uh, they unfortunately don't qualify for the benefits. And so when they hit retirement, unfortunately, they, they just don't have that, that luxury. And that, obviously, to me was frustrating because we are uh, very grateful to the service that they provide to the state. We are in a crisis, and I think there is a responsibility and obligation that we say thank you. And I, and I think that this is one of the ways we can do that. So now I will move into how I believe we can help them with that specific issue. Uh, on the con in my conceptual amendment, I'm looking at NRS 286.510. You will see that I crossed out five years instead and put it at three years. Um, and I think that addresses that issue. Um, the second issue that we heard uh, that is also very frustrating to me is that they're paying an, an excessive amount of money. So the recruitment process is they are in the Philippines, somebody comes in, sells them this idea of coming to Nevada. There's a great program. We desperately need you there. Please come in. And uh, anecdotally, in speaking with a lot of these uh, teachers, they were spending anywhere between $11,000 to $20,000 uh, for them to be able to participate in this program, which is, to me, absurd. Absolutely unnecessary for them to pay that much. Uh, uh, and I've had an opportunity to speak with the legal community folk who engage in this process, it is a cookie cutter process. And what I mean by that is the folk that are recruiting the teachers are replicating and have almost a, a um, very minimal uh, 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 investment of time between one case and another. They're just kind of doing the same thing over and over. So it, it, it cannot be justified to be charging them $20,000, $10,000, $15,000. Um, and so what we're, we're hoping to do is that we create a cap of how much they can charge. The uh, school district works with a host of, of, of firms, um, and we asked the teachers, and we, we found out that the, some of the teachers are only paying $5,000, and we thought that was fair. Um, and we just thought it, it did not make any sense that we have teachers paying more. So we want to create a cap so that we're not taking advantage of folk who are here to meet our despa desperation. Um, and so we want to make sure that everybody's paying the same amount. Um, and that is the objective with this bill. I also just wanted to put on the record that I have committed and I've been uh, having a conversation with the governor's office as we are also interested in, in doing something at a larger scale 
so that we could potentially help some of these teachers remain here longer than just three years. The reason I say that is um, it takes a principal about two years or three just to train somebody so that they fall in the culture of that school, so that they understand how to, the best practices. And then they finally train them, and then it's a revolving door and they got to leave. And then you start that dance all over again. Um, so if we're in a crisis mode, if we have all these vacancies, um, it, it is in the best interest of our students, it is in the best interest of the school, that we create a mechanism so that these individuals can stay here longer. Um, and it's also in the best interest of the child. If you have the same, again, they're working with the most vulnerable population. Um, if you have that same teacher for three years, if you have that same teacher for five years, that teacher can measure the growth of some of these students. If you have this constant revolving door where you're constantly changing them out, you don't know that maybe uh, child A, um, who maybe is acting up, is, is not as bad as it was two years ago, right? If maybe they're still uh, uh, self-harming themselves, but it's not as bad as it was two years ago, all those things are really important. So longevity of, of some of these teachers is super important. Uh, but that conversation is going to continue, and we're hoping to work with the governor's office with that. Um, with that, we will open it up for questions. And again, any, any technical questions regarding our PERS system, I will hand over. Senator Flores, I have a couple questions for you. So I'm familiar with the J-1 visa, and I, too, think that they are charged, charged exorbitant amounts of money to be able to come here to fill a need that we have in our state. And I feel like, I'll call them brokers, I don't really know what they are, but um, these brokers are taking advantage of the need that we have and making money for themselves. But my question is, do we have other nationalities of people that are coming here on J-1 visas? And I know a lot, most of them come from the Philippines, but do we have others, and do they have the same kinds of issues that they're facing? Thank you for that question, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Edgar Flores, for the record. Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Um, it, it's who we're building relationships with, and the Philippines is who we've built that really strong relationship with now. Um, and the, the, the beautiful thing about the, the relationship is that they build their curriculum in terms of how they prepare their teachers and build them up so that it matches what we would expect a Nevada teacher to have, that minimum requirement. Uh, but, the, but the answer is yes, we could have them from any other country. It's, it's just establishing that relationship and the broker, uh, as you've uh, alluded to them, kind of going and setting up that bridge to Nevada. Um, but I do agree with you that they're taking advantage of, of, of the teachers because they sell the idea of coming to the U.S. and look, you're gonna be a teacher there, it's gonna be great. But uh, just $20,000 for a teacher is just absolutely crazy. Um, 15,000, 10,000, 11,000 is absolutely crazy. Um, and, and, and I've heard from some teachers where they're told uh, on the, oh, we're gonna work on, on the waiver process because after you apply for three years, um, you have to apply for a waiver to get that extended for an additional year and then a, a year after that. Uh, for that waiver process, sometimes they'll tell them that it's gonna be another $10,000 but it's worth it you know, so it's, it's really frustrating what we're hearing from um, our teachers. Uh, and I think that there's a, an obligation for us to just cap it. Uh, those those folks, they're still going to continue to make money. Um, and I don't want, we're not asking uh, the folks that are involved in creating that bridge not to make money. We want them, we understand that they have a job to do. But we can do it within reason. We have approximately, um, I want to say it was a, you know, it ranges every year, but close to 300 folk that come in on this type of uh, program. And at any given moment in, in Clark County, we go up to about 300 teachers that are on it. Multiply 300 times 10,000 times 15,000, it's just an excessive amount of money. If it's two, two 300 teachers at 5,000, they're still gonna make money, um, but it, it's within reason. Okay, thank you. And one more question. I just wanna ask you a question about the PERS. So if you have someone that comes here, and they come here a minimum of usually of three years, is that correct? But we're trying to get it extended to five. So maybe the maximum they'd stay in the United States is five. They'd be eligible for PERS at three years, right? I mean, maybe you could explain it to us just so we make sure we're all on the same page. 
Thank you for the question, Madam Chair. Cabrina Fazer for the record, Operations Officer for the Public Employees Retirement System of Nevada. Under 286.510, subsection 1, the current vesting is five years, and so um, they would need to work five years in order to be eligible for a benefit at age 65 currently. Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Lane. I was wondering how much, or how, how much would this impact uh, PERS and um, the system? Because I know in ec with equity, it'd be five years, and so we're saying for this subpopulation, three years, and because um, I know that every year it goes up like 39% for fire and police, it's I believe close to 50%. So on top of the wage, the entity has to pay another 33 or 39%. I know it's going up every year. <laughs> it's been a while since I've actually done payroll, but um, anyway, if you could answer that. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, to you through, go directly, okay. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Senator Buck, for the question. That's a great question. And so um, with the provision or the conceptual idea here. It wouldn't be um, just these J-1 visa holders. It would be anybody who is a re in the regular fund with um, any public employee in the regular fund, the vesting period would change to three years. And so the reason for that is um, generally we prefer that pol policies apply to all memberships and not just a specific group. Um, we understand that there may be some times where that um, may make sense, but for this instance, the preference would be that it would go towards all members. And um, furthermore, we did reach out with the system's actuary just to get a cost. And I think that took a while for um, us to get the language to you. And so I've been working with Senator Flores on that. And based on the cost of transitioning the regular employees to three-year vesting, there was a minimum cost. And Madam Chair, if I may add, Senator Buck, thank you for your question. And, and, and the reason, just to make it abundantly clear, um, we, d we wanted to make sure that we weren't giving a benefit to non-residents that a, a citizen wouldn't have, right? And I, so out of fairness, uh, we wanted to make sure that everybody was tr being treated equally. I know that there's always questions about, you know, the unfunded liability of PERS. And I'm a PERS recipient, so, you know, I'm grateful to that retirement after 25 years. Um, and so I, I just wonder a little bit on, on that, if you could just touch on that, like how that would impact it, or will it raise the percentage of rates that the state taxpayers have to put into it? Because... If you make, say, $100,000 a year, you have to pay another 40, you know, I think it's 39 and three quarters percent now as if it's an administrator in a school district, say. You have to pay that in addition um, to meet your payroll. Is that correct? So currently, yes, there's a contribution rate based, um, based off of eligible wage. Please state your name. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, Senator Buck, thank you for the question. Cabrina Fazer, for the record. Um, yes, there is the contribution rate that is paid on behalf of all employees that are eligible for membership. And we did get confirmation that the J-1 visa teachers are eligible and are being enrolled in PERS. And so those contributions are already currently being paid on their behalf. Um, it's just with the current mechanism of them being here on three years, they're not reaching the vesting period. Okay, and one more. I just want to make a comment. I agree with you completely on whoever these brokers are. Um, maybe we need to uh, have another bill or something that really limits that even more so than just this, this language. Um, because to me, it, it would seem natural that we would want them here at least five years, if at all possible, or potentially longer if they're being productive and teaching and, and adding value to our students in the state, uh, why wouldn't we do that if it's filling a need? And we definitely need teachers. So just to comment on that. But thank you, Chair. You're welcome. And Madam Chair, if I could just, I, I just got a message and I wanted to clarify for the record. Senator Graflores, for the record, um, 
uh, Clark County School District, my understanding, has 375 um, uh, presently. I, I think I had said 300 approximately, but it's uh, 375. Uh, and there's a, di there's a, I believe there's another school district that also has a few, but Clark County uh, School District is who has the largest amount. And I just wanted to, to reflect that for the record. Thank you. Senator Titus. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, uh, on the PER subject, so uh, similar to the lines of uh, Senator Buck's questions, um, if we change PERS from 65 to 62 or even 60, that would have to be changed for every person that is currently in the PERS system, not just this subset of 371 teachers, correct? Thank you for the question, Senator Titus Cabrina Fazer, for the record. And so um, I believe the idea here would be to change the vesting period, and that would be for anybody who would be employed on or after the effective date of the legislation. And um, so anybody who's employed working, then that's when the vesting period would change is based off of the date of the legislation. Okay. The current... Um, Time frames as far as six at 65, 10 at 62, the different tiers, all of that. Um, everybody currently has five at 65, regardless of what tier. And so it would just be three at 65. I just want to make sure we weren't, again, just looking at this as teachers because there's a whole um, significant group of people who work and are, are putting it into PERS. So, yeah, we couldn't just have one person vested so thank you for that clarity second thing a question if i might i have i look at it predatory practice for these j1 visa that, that these attorneys and these groups charge them and it's not just j1 visas in the education world but we have j1 visas that we bring in nurses doctors work with many it took us eight years to bring a nurse in from the philippines and um and lab technicians and all of those so this just doesn't fall on um the teachers but all the j1 visas that we use to supplement our health care system uh, across the board I, I like the idea because I always felt that it was unfair that they got charged so much money uh, and I felt that it was a truly a predatory practice but I don't know if we can um, is it, and I, I'll turn to our attorney on this, is it, can we um, actually, in, in a free market, control what somebody charges somebody? I mean, it seems to me like if there, we could shop around and you can get somebody who'll do a good service for that fee, but will you still be able to have those folks? Or, or will you have enough of those folks who practice that style if you tell them you can only charge 5000 I worry about interfering with commerce. Thank you, Madam Chair, Asher Killian, Committee Council. So uh, as, as proposed, um, effectively what this language would be doing would be prohibiting a, a portion of the state, a school district, a, a public entity, um, from paying more than a certain amount for a certain service. Um, and the state has the ability to decide for itself what level of money it's willing to pay for a particular service. This isn't capping the fees that the agencies themselves can charge. It's just saying that the agency would not be a customer. Right. That the state agency would not be a customer of the the entity at that rate, and, and that's where I worry. So, and thank you for that clarification. So, we as a state can say, hey, you know, we won't do business with anybody that charges more than five thousand dollars, right? But that doesn't mean that those folks won't say to the person, "I'm not going to take your case unless you pay me." So, typically, does the school pick up the cost of what they're charging these folks? I think the individuals pay, correct, not the state. So thank you for that question, uh, Senator Titus. Uh, Edgar Flores, for the record. Um, if I could backtrack just a little bit. There is a, and I'm just going to call it a sponsor, just for the sake of clarity. Okay. There's a, a, a sponsorship relationship. Uh, there's a form called the DS-2019 and DS-160. Uh, these are typical, and those, app, those forms are uh, less than $200 each. $200 less, uh, both. Um, they, the sponsor is who provides that form or that application to the, t the teacher that we're potentially trying to re recruit. Um, and presently, the school district works, and let's just call them agencies uh, or brokers as so that we can be consistent with the language we've been using in this conversation. They'll work with those brokers, um, and they have a pre-established relationship with them now. And so what we're saying is, some of the teachers are, have n notified us that they paid $5,000. That's who the relationship was with. 
and others paid much more. So what we're asking is the sponsor in this case, being the school district, uh, that they specifically establish a relationship with the, the brokers now that are, are at that $5,000 uh, level. Um, and that would, that would alleviate having a teacher, because some of them paid 5000 and some of them paid fifteen, and some of them paid $20,000. Um, so we're just asking the, the school district to set up that relationship with that broker that sets it at 5000 so, again, uh, thank you for semi-clarifying that. So instead of the individual um, person that's coming here using the broker to come to America, um, you're asking that the school district takes over that role and covers the cost of doing that as opposed to then allowing the individual person that's coming here to be charged from the broker. No, th thank you for that question, Senator Titus. Edgar Flores, for the record. No, the... The teachers who's, who is ultimately paying that fee, the teachers is who's paying that. But the teacher doesn't have the luxury of going to the sponsor. It's the sponsor comes to the teacher. And so the sponsor here is the school district in essence. And the school district is, is setting up the relationship with the brokers. And so what we're telling the school district is if you're not going to agree with this cap, we're not going to have a relationship with you. But it's, the, it's presently the folk that the school district is working with. Some of those brokers are just charging an excessive amount of money. But my point to this is we just want to ensure that the relationship maintains a limit, right? Because we don't want to just allow any broker to come in. And again, we're just using that terminology for the sake of this conversation. We want to ensure that the broker that the school district is working with is, uh, is going to cap it at 5000 Because, again, the, the Form DS-2019, you, you can't just log in and, and apply. It's the sponsor who has to give it to the, to the teacher. And the only way that, that that relationship ever starts is the sponsor setting up the bridge, speaking with the broker, lay a foundation, they apply, and then they show up to the school district, and then they get placed in their school, right? Um, so again, we're just asking the school district to please make sure that they're w working with the broker um, that's willing to set that cap at 5000 They exist already. There's some that are, in my opinion, incredibly expensive, and we would like to terminate the relationship with that. Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I don't know if this was asked. On the PERS piece of the – yeah. On the PERS. So I was looking at it um, – you're creating the three years where they vest, but J-1 visa typically expires after five years, correct? N uh, thank you for that question, Senator Neal. So presently the J-1 exchange program is typically for teachers for three years. And then you can apply two additional years, and usually there's a waiver process that is involved in that. But typically it's three years, and then after your three years, you, you would go back, in this case, typically is the Philippines. And that's why they're not vesting, because they, they never hit the five years. Now, if they do qualify for the waiver t uh, on two separate years, and they hit the five years, then those folk are vesting. Um, the issue is that the majority of them are here for three years, and then there's a revolving door, and then uh, another teacher replaces that, that teacher on the J-1. So they never hit the five years. Uh, many of them don't hit the five years. Okay. Thank you for that. Madam Chair, follow-up? Yes. So how did – how – I guess administratively, right, how does the PERS work? Um, they vest, you're allowing them to vest after three years of service. They're now exiting and going back to another country. Now you're asking PERS to do an actuarial analysis on an individual that is no longer residing in the United States. Um, thank you, Senator Neal, for the question. Cabrina Fazer, for the record. And so once somebody is in a vested status, their service credit and everything stays with the system until they're eligible to draw a benefit unless they apply for a reduced benefit. And so at that point in time, they would be considered vested. That would be the status in our um, computer database. And then upon um, them reaching vested, 
um, we would reach out to them or try to, um, you know, we do statements, annual statements for inactive, our vested members who aren't currently working. So we would reach out to them, make them aware of any um, potential benefits that they have with the system. And so that would be one approach. Um, furthermore, we have been in communication with Clark County School District on creating a communication initiative um, with them an annual um, communication with any J-1 visa holders just to make them aware of PERS, their rights to it, and mm -hmm. the eligibility, and then um, possibly also reaching out upon their um, terminating so that we have accurate um, mailing addresses, email information, anything that we have that we can communicate with them. Um, on a future basis. Furthermore, our computer system does allow for them to create an online access, and we are in the middle of a computer system upgrade, which would then do some additional features to help them keep all the records up to date with us. Thank you for that. One more question? Sure. So, okay. In this committee, we heard bills, I guess it's about alternative route to licensure, but also student teaching, right? Flexing student teaching. Is there any other group that is allowed to vest as a student teacher at three years? Or are we making this for J-1 visa folks versus the student teachers who probably would benefit from that relationship as well? Thank you for the question, Senator Neil Cabrina Fazer, for the record. And so the this... Um idea or the conceptual idea behind this with it all vesting for regular members, teachers, um, any public employee would be at three years, not just specific to the J-1 visa holders. And so it would be changing the vesting requirements for any and all members in the regular fund. It's not expensive? <laughs> How is, how is, then, I mean, I guess I'm confused on how it's a minimal cost when, I guess because I'm literally going through a PERS conversation now, and it's very hard, it's very hard once it's set in stone for a lot of different reasons. Um, but, okay, I'm going to leave these questions alone. All right, thanks. Senator Buck. So along with my colleague down there, I, I would like to see an analysis of how much the three years change for all PERS recipients is going to cost our state. I just would like to see that in black and white, not maybe answered right now, but okay. before I actually vote on this. And then also, when you go from five years vested to three years vested for everyone, um, as this bill proposes, um, doesn't it do the reverse of trying to get longevity um, in our profession, keeping teachers? Um, I know that sometimes that teachers don't realize the great benefit of our public retirement system in that after 25 or 30 years that you're able to uh, retire and it doesn't matter the age. So you would think that that would um, reverse our goal of keeping teachers in classrooms. Uh, thank you for that question, Senator Buck. Uh, Edgar Flores, for the record. Uh, well, I think it's important to backtrack uh, just a little bit. First, uh, I want to remind folk that presently, um, and like I mentioned in Clark County School District, we're talking about 375 teachers. These folk right now are doing a tremendous service to our state. Um, without them, our, 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 a lot of our schools would collapse because we're already in a de in desperation mode. Um, and, our, and my principals in my district and, in, and uh, other districts have made it abundantly clear that they desperately need our, our teachers there, our J1s in particular. Um, I, I make that point because presently, they're paying into something they're never gonna get a benefit out of. That's presently the case now. And it's been going on for years. Um, and so we've done a disservice as a state to desperately have to go to another country and beg people to come here to meet the needs we can't do ourselves. We've inadequately been able to uh, uh, fulfill our obligation to our kids and to our families. And so for a long, very, very long time, we've been taking advantage of other humans, bringing them over, 
I'm not giving them uh, uh, that benefit. In my opinion, I, I see the opposite happening. Because when we tell, uh, the, the point of bringing a teacher during a crisis mode, and I pray that one day we don't need a J-1 program because we have all the teachers here, they're from our neighborhoods, and, and that we don't have to rely on another country to save us because we can't fulfill a need. Uh, I pray that that day comes, but I, I foresee that we're probably still years away from that. Um, my point is, it is a great uh, uh, point of attraction to be able to tell somebody, if you come to Nevada and you fulfill an obligation that we cannot fulfill ourselves with our kids, that those individuals are going to be more interested in participating in coming to Nevada because they're going to realize, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm also going to get a retirement benefit out of this. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, when we talk about person, I know the conversation has expanded, is that the, li the lifespan of an individual in, in the school district versus uh, just a government employee, in my opinion, is, is different. You will see a lot of folk, because I agree with you that the whole point of PERS is that we want longevity, we want people to uh, participate and stay, uh, but you'll see that folk move between agencies often, right? Maybe this state agency wasn't for me, but I'll go to this state agency. This one's great. I, I'll do this, maybe I'll do that. It's different with teachers because um, as a teacher, you're not just going to stop that profession and then say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do some other random job. Uh, uh, typically, what you'll see is that they go from school A to school B. They remain as teachers. Uh, I, I'm just making that point that you're, 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 you're kind of hypothetical of are we promoting longevity or not by moving from five to three. I just think if we focus strictly on the conversation of teachers, because I know we, we're expanding it, and so now you know, kind of opened up this whole other conversation up here. Um, but you will see that folk want PERS, and they want to make sure that they have these benefits and that they're going to stay within government work. But with teachers, usually what ends up happening is just you're going from point A to point B, and it's just another school. That's usually the transition you'll see. And I'm not suggesting that no teacher has ever said, you know what, I'm not going to work at a school anymore, and, and they realize that maybe the profession wasn't for them. Um, but I think realistically, if you invested that amount of training to be a teacher, you've devoted uh, a lot of years of, of preparation for it, it's typically what you'll see is just teachers transitioning from one school to the other. So I, I don't think that we're really going to hurt that model um, by saying, well, three years is all you need for PERS to be vested. I just don't think somebody's would take advantage of the system in that way, say, let me, let me become a teacher, let me get all the certifications, let me go through that whole entire dance um, so that I can be there for three years and then somehow walk out. I, I just, I, I don't really foresee that happening. Um, but I'm sure there'll be some scenarios where it does happen. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, bottom line, is if you serve our kids for three years, you should absolutely get a benefit for that. You should have the confidence in saying, you know what, I tried it for three years, maybe it didn't work out, but I, I, I still believe that they, sh they should get this benefit. Um, so, that, that, you know, kind of that ideological kind of conversation is there, but I also know you have some technical uh, kind of points that you want to address, and I, and I can have her do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think the easiest way would just to have them stay for five years. It would really fulfill them in our classrooms as well as pay them like everyone else. Because I would like to see how many yeah, state employees would be, um, there are that would meet that criteria um, across the board, you know, at some point and not right now maybe. Um, because to change a whole entire system for 375, yes, and we, I'm not downplaying, we need them, we need more of them, <laughs> obviously, in our, in our pipeline, but to change that entire uh, system, which I don't know how many people are even on PERS or eligible for PERS or paying into PERS, it's all of our firefighters, our state employees, I mean, it's an expansive system, I'm thinking in the thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe, I don't know. 
Thank you for the question, Senator Buck. Um, I will, Cabrina Fazer for the record. I will go ahead and start with how our membership. So our current membership is over 108,000 members and PERS and 79,000 benefit recipients. And so it is a very large population. Um, furthermore, you did ask for statistics. If this legislation, um, as of today, we have 14,000 members that have three year that are active members that have three years of service credit, but aren't to the five to vest. So there's 14,000 where if this was effective today, that they would now be considered vested. Um, and as far as the actuarial cost, I would like to comment on that. Um, some of the reason it's a minimum cost is because it's just imp imp the idea behind it is just the vesting period. It's not changing the provisions to purchase service anytime sooner. That would still be five years in order to qualify to purchase. It wouldn't be changing our disability benefit. That would still be at five years in order to qualify for that. That is how the actuary is able to get this in at a minimum cost for the regular membership is because it would just be the vesting, the eligibility to have a benefit with three years of service at age 65. In addition, the actuary did make a comment that um, you know, there are other pension plans that have gone this route, mm -hmm. and um, it was for recruitment and retention because if you're vested at three years, maybe you don't want a 6.75% benefit. Maybe you're gonna work till you get a 10% of your average comp or 15. It's just incentizing them, hey, I vested earlier. Now if I continue on, I'm gonna get more money because I'm guaranteed a benefit. And I would say, yes, that's awesome if our teachers knew that. But we do a horrible job in this state of educating our teachers on this amazing benefit that they do have if they stick it out. So thank you. I and and uh, Madam Chair, I, I forgot to mention this, and thank you again, Senator Buck, for the questions. Um, that I 100% I agree with you that in the ideal scenario, we would just allow our J1s to be here for five years. Unfortunately, that, that we don't have control of that. That's just the way the program is established by the Department of State. Um, it's for three years, and that's why they have to do a waiver process to, to extend that any further. If we could fix that, then I would, I would have done that for sure, and I agree 100%. Unfortunately, that, that's the component that we have no control over, so we have to address it this way. But I do appreciate that comment. Okay, thank you. If you will step back, we'll open for public comment. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to speak in favor of Senate Bill 308? Madam Chair, I apologize. No way. Uh, Senator Flores, uh, for the record. I also just want to do a quick shout out. Uh, I, uh, Assemblywoman Erica Mosca uh, has been instrumental in this conversation in both working with the teacher uh, uh, part of this community and also with coming up with a lot of this language. Unfortunately, she couldn't join me today, but I just wanted to, uh, wanted to reflect, uh, that the record reflect, excuse me, uh, just how instrumental she's been, and I wanted her to get her due credit. Thanks for the shout out. Do you have one more thing? Thank you, um, Cabrina Fazer, for the record. I didn't get an opportunity to address this. Um, just as Senator Flores had mentioned, um, we have not been able to take, staff has not been able to take this to the full retirement board since they meet on April 20th. However, staff will be recommending neutral. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, anyone in Las Vegas wishing to speak in favor of Senate Bill 308? BPS, anyone on the phones wishing to speak in favor of Senate Bill 308? Justify in support of SB 308, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Uh, good oh, afternoon. Uh, this is Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon. This is Anna Binder for the record, A-N-N-A-B-I-N-D-E-R. I'm calling in support of this um, Senate bill because um, my seven-year-old previously nonverbal autistic son has been paired with a J-1 educator um, since the pandemic, and he is now thriving. She is wonderful. She's been such a beautiful asset. Um, to our elementary school 
And I really try to stand up for her at any point that we have. You know, we've had a couple things in the last couple of years um, to, that they've needed support on. But um, I know Miss Callow, my son's teacher, is just amazing. And we just really want to keep her here as long as possible. And um, I'm sure she's not the only J1 educator in our district that is so beneficial for our special needs children. Um, but J1 teachers do tend to specialize in special ed, and we need all the help we can get in that. So thank you, and um, I support this bill. Thank you. Thanks so much. Any more callers, BPS? Yes, Chair. One moment. Hello, y'all. My name is Hugh Lee, uh, H-I-D-U, last name L-E. Uh, from the fabulous Senate District 3 and the really heated right now Assembly District 3. Uh, just wanted to say I'm in support of the bill. This helps out a lot of our AAPI teachers and substitute teachers into pursuing more into their career. Thanks so much. Next caller, please. Yes, my name is uh, Daniel Stewart with the law firm of Brownstein Hyatt, and we are representative of Clark County um, Educators uh, Educators Association (CCA). We are in full support of this bill. Uh, our teacher, teacher vacancy, especially in Clark County, is bad enough, uh, and right now there's we understand there's over 300 J1 teachers in the mix. Um, we need to do as much as we can to keep them. They are fantastic at what they do. Uh, and make sure that they be, remain a critical part uh, of our uh, education infrastructure. And I, again, thanks and uh, full support. Thanks so much. Next caller, please. Hello, my name is Craig Valdez. I'm a resident of Las Vegas and I'm an active member of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. With so many J-1 teachers who identify as Filipino, I'm calling in today in support of SB 308 to ensure that J-1 teachers receive the benefits that they deserve. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next caller, please. If you have just joined us, I'd like to testify in support of SB 308. Press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Caller, you're unmuted. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. Francisco Morales here, also uh, representing the Clark County Education Association, in full support of SB 308. And we thank uh, Senator Flores for putting this forward. Uh, it, it's a it's a great piece of legislation to to really give uh, the, the well deserved benefit that these teachers deserve for for helping our kids, teaching our kids. And until we can fix uh, this program at the federal level, this is definitely a great step forward and we urge your support. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next caller, please. Chair, there are no calls willing to testify in support at this time. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to Senate Bill 308 in Carson City or Las Vegas? Anyone on the telephones? To testify in opposition of SB 308, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers willing to testify in opposition. Okay, thank you. Anyone in neutral in Carson City or Las Vegas? Anyone in neutral on the telephone lines? To testify in neutral to SB 308, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Hello, this is Kent Irvin, K-E-N-T-E-R-V-I-N, -E -E State President of the Nevada Faculty Alliance. I'm also an appointed member of the Nevada Deferred Compensation Program, but I am not speaking in that capacity, but have that experience. It occurs to me, so I am uh, 
just seeing the amendment today. Uh, so we are neutral as the Nevada Faculty Alliance. We were neutral on the original bill. But I want to point out that a state pension system really isn't very well suited for short-term employees of a few years, and that they're at NSHE, at the Nevada System of Higher Education, there are categories of employees in similar positions, our postdoctoral scholars and our medical residents, who by statute have been exempted from PERS and the other regular retirement system, but instead have an alternative. I'm aware of two different kinds of alternatives for those as well as graduate students. One is the FICA alternative plan, Social Security replacement plan. That, I believe, however, is for part-time and seasonal employees. But for our postdoctoral scholars and medical residents who typically have a limit on the employment of either three or four or five years, they are in a mandatory 403B program in which they are fully invested um, and contributions go from the system and then their own employer contribution, employee contributions into a 403B plan, which they can take with them. So I just wanted to put that on the record that there may be some alternatives that would work in this sort of situation for the exchange teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Any more callers, PPS? Chair, there are no more callers willing to testify at this time. Thank you, Senator Flores. And he is good. So we are going to take about a two minute recess till Senator Don Darrell Loop gets back from her other committee to present her bill. And we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 308.
Thank you. I'll call us back to order. And we will open the hearing on Senate Bill 442. Senator Dondero Loop. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for the second time at the microphone. For the record, I am Senator Marilyn Dondero Loop, representing Senate District 8 in Clark County. I am presenting Senate Bill 442, which enacts the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact. This compact is an exciting opportunity for Nevada. I'm joined today by my co-presenters, Dr. George Ann Rice in Las Vegas, and Adam Deersing, Jimmy Adams, and Kelly Mae Douglas, who are on Zoom. I'll have each of them introduce themselves in just a minute. Before I go into the specifics of this bill, I would like to provide with you some context. The Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact is an initiative of the United States Department of Defense, the Council of State Governments, and the National Association of State Directors of Teacher Education and Certification. It is a licensing compact to help alleviate barriers that teachers face when relocating for seeking employment in a new state. This legislature has debated on measures over the years to address these and other barriers to teaching, including the near unanimous passage of SB 100 from 2019, which expedited Nevada teaching license applications for spouses of active duty members of the United States Armed Forces and allowed those members, veterans, and their spouses who obtain a license through another state's alternative route to, lic to licensure program to obtain a license in Nevada. These and other opportunities will help support our focus on removing barriers to teaching and will address in part the teacher shortage crisis we face. My co-presenters will, sp will speak more on this compact, including the development process and how it will all work. Senate Bill 442 enacts the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact, which established requirements for the issuance of a teacher license to an applicant who holds an equivalent license from another state that is also a member of the compact. The sharing of files and information regarding the investigation and discipline of a teacher between member states. The bill requires the Commission on Professional Standards and Education to adopt regulations to carry out the provisions contained in the compact and provided for the licensure pursuant to the compact. Additionally, SB 442 exempts a person who obtains the licensure pursuant to the compact from the examination required for initial licensing. This bill also exempts a person who applies for a license under the compact from submitting proof with the application that he or she has completed an approved course of study or training. Finally, it is, an important, it is very important to note that this compact becomes effective upon ratification from 10 states. According to the teachercompact.org, currently Utah, Colorado, and Kentucky have enacted legislation, and another 16 states, including Nevada, have pending le uh, legislation. Now I would like to turn um, the microphone over to Dr. George Ann Rice in Las Vegas, who has been working diligently on this measure and others to address the teacher pipeline issue that states across our nation are facing. After Dr. Rice, you will hear from uh, Adam Deersing, then Jimmy Walker, followed by Kelly Mae Douglas, and the last three, as I said previously, are on Zoom. And welcome, Dr. Rice. Uh, Dr. Rice is a, a longtime um, friend, but also um, a very, very well-respected um, administrator from the Clark County School District who is now retired. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and please go ahead. Madam Chair and members of the committee, we really appreciate this opportunity to speak on behalf to advocate for SB 442. We're going to take this uh, and have uh, Kelly Mae Douglas, I believe, from the uh, Defense uh, State Defense Alliance Office of the Department of Defense speak uh, as to this bill. Then we'll have uh, Adam Dursing from the uh, Council of State Governments and then Jimmy Adams speaking from NASDAQ, the National Association of State Directors of Teacher Education and Certification. Kelly Mae Douglas from the Defense State Liaison Office. I actually think we've got a slightly different order uh, for the presenting. Okay. I will be going first. Uh, apologize for the confusion on that. 
I am Jimmy Adams. I am the executive director of the National Association of State Directors of Teacher Education and Certification, or NASTEC. And thank you, Madam Chair and the committee members for allowing my colleagues and me to be here today to talk on behalf of the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact. For over 95 years, NASDAQ has worked to improve the portability of educator licenses. In 1965, NASDAQ established the first agreement between states to support educators who are relocating across state lines. Since then, the agreements between states have had many names. Our current version is known as the NASDAQ Interstate Agreement. This agreement was successful in that it opened lines of communication and resulted in established agreements regarding, <clears throat> excuse me, regarding the minimum requirements for a professional license, but the NASDAQ interstate agreement is not reciprocity, it is not binding on a jurisdiction, and it is not an interstate compact. Thanks to funding through the Department of Defense and the technical support from the Council on State Government's National Center for Interstate Compacts, NASDAQ was selected to provide administrative support for states interested in using an interstate compact to facilitate the portability of educator licenses. The Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact, which we're discussing today is Senate Bill 442, allows each member state to identify those high level licenses within their state that meet the same level of professionalism as in other states where the professional teacher holds a bachelor's degree, has completed a state approved educator preparation program, <clears throat> excuse me, with no outstanding requirements and is subject to a criminal records background check by the receiving state. By meeting these criteria, the compact member receiving state can issue an equivalent license based on the three components of content, grade range, and student population, eliminating the overhead of processing paperwork and delays due to the teacher having to provide additional verifying documentation already verified by the sending member state. Through this compact, states maintain their autonomy have full control over their licenses they issue, and the compact simply creates a streamlined process by which a teacher can receive a license and become eligible for employment. This is a win-win as a professional educator or the professional educators gain increased mobility, which is consistent with being a professional, and states benefit from a wider door for effective educators, including sharing of educators across state borders, teleteaching, and reclaiming those who left the profession rather than try to navigate the out-of-state requirements for licensure. And at this time, I'll turn the presentation over to my colleague, Kelly Mae Douglas. Oh, good afternoon, um, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Kelly Mae Douglas, K-E-L-L-I-M-A-Y. D-O-U-G-L-A-S, on behalf of Military Families and the Department of Defense, I'm pleased to provide comments uh, on the highly beneficial impact that policies such as SB 442 have on the military community. The department has prioritized working with states to resolve licensure issues for military members and their spouses for many years. As our military members and their families move from state to state, being able to transfer a professional license easily and quickly to obtain employment is critical to the economic stability and well being of these families. Specifically, military um, spouses are disproportionately affected by state specific licensure requirements that can cause delays and gaps in employment, with over 36% of the working population requiring state licensure to practice in their professions, and an annual cross state location rate more than 10 times higher than their civilian counterparts. Accordingly, Military spouses experience unemployment and underemployment at significantly higher rates than their civilian peers. After over a decade working with states to modify licensure policy to assist military members and their spouses, um, we have identified occupational licensure compacts, such as the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact as the optimal mechanism for creating true reciprocity among all member states. In adopting the ITMC, Nevada can increase its pool of highly qualified teachers, many of whom are members of the military community, address the documented teacher shortages being experienced within the state and throughout the nation, and support um, learning for all students. Given that teaching has been found to be one of the most prevalent of all professions for military spouses, this policy has the potential to have a substantial impact on this population. It is important to note, however, that licensure compacts such as the ITMC not only benefit military spouses, 
but also all eligible professionals coming into the state. Thank you for allowing me to um, provide comments on the positive impact of this measure to the Department of Defense and military families. Madam Chair, I'd like to now introduce Adam Dursing from the Council of State Governments. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Adam Dearsing, Senior Policy Analyst for the Council of State Governments. I wanted to take a brief opportunity to speak today to discuss the development process for this compact, as well as the national perspective of legislation to enact the Interstate Future Mobility Compact across the country. The development of this model legislation began in September of 2021 with the assembly of a technical assistance group comprised of legislators, state education department officials, members of professional associations, licensed teachers and other stakeholders, including Senator Don Darrell Loop at that time. The group met over the course of several months to determine the needs of the profession in mobility and the model needed to meet those needs, um, but also to integrate with existing licensure systems that exist within states. A separate drafting team transitioned those recommendations uh, from the technical assistance group into a full draft of the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact legislation. Uh, that went through several months of public comment and stakeholder review, with the final draft being published in November of 2022. We've seen significant movement in the early legislative sessions this year to enact the Teacher Mobility Compact. Uh, as was mentioned by George Ann, to date, three states have signed the model legislation into law, being Colorado, Utah, and Kentucky. Along with Nevada, 15 other states have filed the model legislation, and four of those have passed at least one chamber of their legislature. As noted in the legislation, once the 10th state enacts the model legislation, the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact will go into effect and the commission will be convened. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at this time on the function of the compact, um, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm next, the next speaker and the last uh, from our group, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Again, thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the passage of SB 442. My name is Dr. Georgia Ann Rice, G-E-O-R-G-E, -E, capital A-N-N, -N, Rice, R-I-C-E. -E. I retired in 2007 with 34 years of service to the Clark County School District, the last 16 of which were as um, Associate Superintendent of Human Resources. So my remarks come to you today from my experience and now my continuing work with states and school districts in our country through Heroes to Education. The issues of this compact, that this compact addresses, are not unique to our state, but are of particular importance to our state. In this uh, second semester of the school year, Going into second semester, CCSD had 1,400 certified positions vacant. Now take that times the up to 30 students that they would have in those classrooms. Unable to find the teachers needed. Washoe, at the same time, came into second semester with almost 300 such positions. And even a much smaller Lyon County went into the second semester with 28 teacher vacancies. Looking at the 2023-24 school year, before even knowing the number who will retire or just resign at the end of the year, CCSD is now recruiting for 1,297 teachers and Washoe for 350. And Lyon is recruiting for at least 100 teachers, the largest amount, the greatest number that they have ever had at, uh, to begin a new year. At this time, not only here in Nevada, but all over the country, colleges of education are decreasing in enrollment. In my 16 years, a majority of our new hires every single year had to be sought from outside our borders because our own institute, institutions of higher education could not possibly prepare enough educators for even Clark County, let alone the other 16 districts. That issue has not changed. With the bill before the legislature, as I understand it, to decrease class size, much needed, we will need to find even greater numbers of teachers to fill those classrooms. 
and now remember a problem that we really didn't have before I retired. We are also competing with companies, eager comp uh, companies, and fields offering many more extrinsic rewards, extrinsic rewards than we are uh, able to offer. We cannot afford to have teachers who uh, are moving into our state or even considering a move decide not to come or even decide to leave the profession rather than take another group of tests, another class unique to our uh, state. We know that the compact, uh, under the compact, these unique requirements can be required when they renew their license, giving them a period of years to get any extra things taken care of. Looking at it again through the eyes of a military spouse whose family is being transferred from one of our three installations, military installations here in Nevada, they would be able to take their Nevada teaching license into the state where they are being sent, not because they want to necessarily go, but because it's good for our country. They would be able to take their Nevada license into that new state without all of the uh, issues and tests and classes and so on. I talked with one such spouse who has six different teaching certificates, and she told me about all of the tests that she had to take in unique classes um, before she was able to continue her career. And again, she, they, the family wasn't relocating for their pleasure or for opportunities or whatever. They were moving for the good of our country. Again, thank you for this opportunity to advocate on behalf of this very important bill. And as an aside, the first 10 states to pass the compact, and remember three states have already passed it, into law will have the opportunity to convene, to send a representative uh, to Washington to work with NASDAQ to draft the governing regulations or bylaws. So far, of the 19 states that have introduced the bill, again, three have passed it. It would be wonderful if Nevada could be number four. And the bill, as Adam just said, was available in November and probably sent out to uh, the various states in uh, December. So there haven't been many uh, opportunities yet. Uh, to get that bill passed. So in just this short period of time, three months, we see that already 19 states have introduced this very, very important legislation. And now, Madam Chairman, I turn it back to you. Thank you so much. And I was going to have questions, but you just answered many of them. So that's good. Senator Titus. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And actually, I don't have any questions, I just have a thank you. Here's something we all can agree on, and uh, so I appreciate you bringing this forward because this is a true need, so thank you. Madam Chair, and thank you very much, Senator. Uh, but I really need to send out uh, my appreciation and thank you to Dr. George Ann Rice and the team that you just heard from because they have led the charge and uh, they have been relentless in making sure that all this information was to me so that I could do this uh, legislation. So thank you. If I could just interrupt for a second. Dr. Rice, we are going to lose video feed in Las Vegas in just a few minutes. And the only way you'll be able to connect to the meeting is if you call in. They're, they tell me there's no other room we can move to. So do you have the number? We will send you the number so you have it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Any more any more questions from the committee? I will just give a brief comment to say I really like this. I was at CSG in Hawaii last year when we heard the presentation, and I could get really excited about it for Nevada. I think it offers so much to us, and um, being one of the first 10 states to be able to try and get on the board would be um, instrumental as we want to move this forward and ensure that 
um, our goals and standards in our state are met in a national way. So I hope that we can move this forward. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And with so many military bases in Nevada, I think this is just really an important piece of uh, legislation. And I appreciate all your time today. Thanks. And if you step back, we'll take a public comment while we still have video feed. Anyone wishing to speak in favor in Carson City? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Amy Shogren. That's S-H-O-G-R-E-N with Black and Wadhams representing the Vegas Chamber this afternoon. Uh, the Chamber is in support of SB 442, um, establishing the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact to really encourage teachers to come to the great state of Nevada, um, removing the barriers to entry to well-qualified education professionals is an essential step forward towards improving our education in the state. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Przinski here representing Nevada Association of School Superintendents uh, composed of all, our organization is composed of all 17 uh, superintendents. And we want to thank uh, Senator Don Darrell Loop for bringing this important piece forward and also uh, Dr. Rice for uh, her involvement in uh, all of this and we are in full support of this really good bill and we should pass it so we're on the board. So. Thank you so much. BPS, is there anyone on the phone lines wishing to speak in favor? Chair, there are no callers want to testify in favor at this time. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak against in Las Vegas? Anyone in opposition on the phones? Testify in opposition of SB 442, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Um, that went really quick. Uh, this is Anna Binder, A-N-N-A-B-I-N-D-E-R. Um, I actually had raised my hand for support. Um, Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm calling in to support Senate Bill um, 442, and I thank um, Senator Dondero Loop uh, for bringing this forward, plus, plus everyone who's helped her. Um, again, I'm just going to reiterate, we've focused a lot on removing barriers to improve our state, and this is a great step in removing barriers from qualified teachers getting kind of pushed to the back of the line who are moving into our state. So. Uh, I love reciprocity. I love working with other states, and I love streamlining, getting qualified educators into our classroom. So full support. Thank you, everyone. Please pass this. Thanks so much. Anyone else, BPS? Chair, there are no more calls from to testify and support. Okay, thank you. Anyone wishing to speak in neutral? BPS, anyone on the phone lines wishing to speak in neutral? Chair, there are no callers willing to testify in the truth. Thank you. Senator Don Darrell Loop. That was quick. She says thank you. <laughs> okay. With that, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 442 and we'll open public comment. Anyone in the and remember public comment is speaking about something other than the bills we heard today. Anyone in Carson City wishing to speak in public comment? Anyone on the phones wishing to speak in public comment? If you would like to provide public comment, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Uh, good afternoon, Anna Binder, A-N-N-A-B-I-N-D-E-R, for the record. Um, I just want to thank the Senate Education Committee for all of the hard work this session. I know we're halfway through. <laughs> My son's in the background. There's no school today, um, and I wish everyone an amazing weekend. Thank you so much for your hard work. Thank you so much. Next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers willing to provide public comment. Thank you. With that, we'll adjourn the meeting of Senate Education, and we'll see you on Monday at 1 o'clock.